And I am here cause you were here and that is clear to me And every time I think of you it's the sweetest memories I am here cause you were here always guiding me The light that shines in me Hello everyone, thank you for joining me today. My name is Pranita Killa. I'm an actor and producer based in Vancouver, British Columbia. I'd like to welcome you to MVP's virtual session series. This session explores the ins and outs of music video production. And today we are here to highlight and discuss Alexander Farah's music video for Desiree Dawson's breathtaking and heart-wrenching song, Meet You at the Light, which is a round six MVP project grant recipient. Meet You at the Light feels incredibly personal. And, and very lived in. It's uh, a, a beautiful piece of art, really, that showcases the intersections of, of, of love and responsibility and patience and um, sacrifice, particularly in a South Asian household. Um, so I guess my question to you, Alex, is how was this idea conceived? The idea was conceived through a childhood best friend that I had um, growing up, and specifically the last I would say eight years, I had what felt like front row access to her and her kind of deteriorating relationship with her, with her dad's health. And I was able to, through our closeness, see what sort of weight that was on their family, specifically of her taking care of him um, and in the presence of, you know, her, her mother and her brother at the time having other commitments, she was the one who was most readily available to be to be taking care of him. And I was what struck me about their relationship was just how um, tender it was. Like it, it never felt like he was a burden to her, but that she she actually um, felt like her identity was was coming to be through the amount of caretaking that she was she was offering to him. And so I was like there's such richness in that relationship and I really want to like turn that into something audiovisual, especially because he had passed away a year before I had applied for the grant and I just felt like this was this was a really beautiful way to to honor someone like that. The MVP grant is is a highly competitive one. I mean there's a lot of uh, you know close to 400 teams that apply um, only a few successful ones end up getting the money to create their music video. So do you come up with a preconceived idea a notion in your head and and then try to pitch it to the artist first, in this case with Desiree? Um, or do you start fresh and build off of her song? It felt like the concept and the song were feeding into each other while I was developing the pitch. Like there was obviously this thing that I really wanted to explore. Um, and then, yeah, I actually, it felt so blurry that I can't distinguish what was feeding into the other. They just felt like they were like, it was a collaboration between the song and the treatment. And the treatment, like, I've been so fixated on the idea that treatments have to be, like, flashy and cool and vibe-heavy and everything. And this was the first time that I was like, let's just do something, like, really simple to the point. Because the idea was so strong, I knew that I didn't have to, like, hide it in something that looked really cool or, like, looked flashy. I was like, okay, I have this idea that feels very authentic and intimate to me. If I just get those words down on paper in a way that's succinct and then attach some visuals that feel like they could be inspiring, I would hope that that would be enough. This was the first time that I felt like I was creating a treatment that was like, I was less dependent on like how slick it was and how palatable it would be to someone. Just like, this is the idea, this is what I want to do. Fund it, you know, <laughs> like. Talk us through your preliminary budgeting process, because you do have to submit a, a preliminary budget when you apply. Um, where do you allocate most of that money? And, and with, with the current market rates, right? Because you, you do have to also refer to current market rates. So, so how, do you take, how do you ask for money? Like, how do you know how much money that you need to ask for? And then how do you know where that money should be allocated to in order to match your, your vision? What really helped with this project specifically was having a bit of money um, that we got through another Career Accelerator grant for Desiree from Creative BC. So I believe that was 8000 That was like a nice little boost to the treatment and just pitching. It probably helped our proposal to want to shoot on film, the fact that we had this sort of like cushion, what felt like cushion money at the time. But a big part of it for me is just like Kashif Sham, our cinematographer Farhad, 
basically working for free to get this made because the budget was so tight with what we had wanted to do is like finding those people where there's that trust. I've worked with Kashif and Sham on, on projects before and I've worked with Farhad on projects before. So there was that collaborative trust and sort of like, you owe me one. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> Nothing like that. But there's like this sort of like, um, there's this energy that is, that is um, built on respect and, and trust and yeah. If anybody else is watching this music video for the first time and they don't know the context, they're probably thinking that these actors are fully like trained actors, uh, you know. Was the thought given initially that, hey, you know what, we have this much money, we're going to invest a lot of this into the performances, or we're going to invest a lot of this into the way this thing looks. Um, how did you go about determining, determining that? A lot of that for us as producers came from kind of the direction that Alex gave. He really knew what he wanted and that made it so easy for us to kind of figure out, okay, this is how it needs to feel. This is how the vision is. Where can we allocate the money to make sure that this is the vision that it comes true? Um, so a lot more in art, um, a lot more in the locations, really making sure these locations felt real, felt comfortable and um, just authentic to the process not only for South Asians, but people going through diabetes. Kashif and Sham were instrumental in just sort of helping the authenticity pour through in the video. Like we're so, at least I'm so used to sort of like having this idea and then dispelling it down to something that is affordable on this budget or just like, oh, we're just going to set deck this hospital looking scene that's generic enough to sort of pass as um, fulfilling the role of the scene, but it doesn't feel like lived in. And with them, I was like, guys, like, we need to shoot at a crematorium, and it needs to be this crematorium that, like, I was at for this specific funeral. Or I was like, hey, it needs to be, like, a, an actual dialysis machine. And they were just like... I, I think it was a bit daunting to try to, like, source some of those things, but it was like, their energy that went into being able to pull those things off was, like, incredible and very valuable to the video. And I think what really... I saw people responding to was like how authentic it felt like even the dialysis technician on the day when we were shooting some of the scenes was like you really got it like this relationship or what you're trying to portray and just seeing like this child with their parent like watching something on an iPad he was like this feels like quite real and this is what I see like every Tuesday and Thursday night here at the clinic so I was like okay like I'm really glad that we we put the energy and the resources into doing that. One thing that helps the budget a ton in terms of feasibility was that clarity of vision. So when Alex was like, we have to film at a real crematorium and you're like, okay, like, let's, let's go for it. Let's make that happen. Let's really make this dialysis machine happen. Uh, one of the things that helps make that happen is the idea wasn't changing every week. You know, like it, it really, like there's adjustments, but it really helped that the time that we were putting into it was all adding up to a final product because when you are working with a smaller budget, um, a lot of money can go in doing something for a week and then the idea completely changing and then spending two weeks on it and then the idea completely changing. Um, and so that actually really helps is like the, where you can really save your money is by the director having their act together as much as possible. Right. And then there's adjustments that happen here and there. Um, let's talk about casting. Let's talk about, uh, the struggle to cast, uh, in particular, the, the father in the story, um, this is where I kind of come into this process in a, in a sense, because I knew this was happening uh, with, with all, all, all of you uh, incredible people. Um, and in particular, yeah, I, I, you know, I was trying to help Alex also <laughs> uh, find a, a, a South Asian father for this. So talk about how you ended up finding your two leads. So Ishavel, who plays the lead, um, she's someone that I met at a Christmas party through a mutual friend like years ago, I would say like three or four years ago. And I knew at the time that she was just emerging or wanting to act more. She was actually working for the NDP at the time. She was in politics. It was a whole thing. Um, but I knew that she wanted to act more. And we had a very brief sort of interaction, but I, you know, she had driven me home that night and I just like felt like she was very, like the impression that she left on me was very warm and outgoing. And I just, I felt like a really nice kindred en energy from her. And so when I was writing this story, I don't even know, like chalking it up to the universe, I don't know what happened, but I just thought of her as I was writing it. Even having not had much contact with her in the, in the last three, four years, I was like, something about me just kept imagining her. 
Um, even though I had this sort of vision of working with a shovel, I still wanted to consider other folks who would be interested in this sort of projects. You never know who you're going to come across. And I went through, I would say maybe like a bit over a dozen tapes just for a shovel and hers was the last tape to come in and it just sort of like solidified my instinct to want to work with her. So I was like, okay, great, lead is covered. And then after that, I was relying on Kashif and Sham, not relying on, but um, hoping that they would have some some South Asian fathers to play um, opposite Ashavel because they have done a lot of um, projects casting in that space. And they did, like, we had a few leads, some were not in the province, it just felt like our budget wasn't able to fly anyone over. Um, finally, with Ashavel, um, I just sort of said, like, would your actual dad be interested in in doing this and she was like I could send him the script and ask him and then that led to me having a conversation like a whatsapp video call with her dad who was just kind of like yeah like why not and I was like that's it <laughs> like um I was expecting like a little more enthusiasm but at the time I think I, I've learned to really like understand his affect um and who he is as a person and now I look at it and I'm like there was no there was nothing to worry about but at the time I was like I just want to make sure that, that he feels like this is something that he's interested in doing and enthusiastic about. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the rehearsal and workshop process, uh, specifically with, uh, you know, the father character who, who has never acted before and, and add on top of that, uh, you know, it's, the, it's the, the, the lead actress and the father are related. I approached the workshop and the rehearsal process with a shovel and her dad, um, Kamal Devender, by just getting insight into their relationship more and more each week as we had worked to sort of rely on things that I could pull on um, or pull through to sort of get them to enact certain situations that weren't necessarily in the script but something that we could sort of play with in the space of in the rehearsal. So improvisational techniques, um, parameters with performance like eye contact exercises, muscle memory, because I knew that they would be like in such close contact with each other. I wanted to make sure that there was enough time for them to really like, if she had to undress him, that she would do it like multiple times on end, just so that once we're on set, there's no sort of hiccups and sort of navigating and feeling close enough to be able to do that. The first day that they came in, they sat on like opposite ends of the couch and I was like, mm, let's like, we're going to need a lot of like, time and energy into getting them to feel as comfortable as possible through this process. I can sp speak for many and myself as well in saying that the rehearsal process, certainly whatever you did those six weeks before production certainly shows. Um, I, th I think I've, I've certainly cried like five, six times just watching it. So uh, uh, great, great success on that one. Um, this brings me to the next step, which is now we're going, we're moving into production now. Um, so again, for emerging filmmakers that that, that want to be as prepared as they can be on the day. Um, what are some key sort of pointers that you can, that you can give them about how early to get uh, your key department heads involved and, and uh, what to do on your location or tech scouts? One thing I would say about the tech scouts and working with crew in general, especially on a tighter budget, is being really, really respectful of people's time. So one thing that happens when you bring folks on early, like we were brought on fairly early to this, um, and I know I'll, I'll, some of the HODs were as well, so then you, as the person being brought on, you then have a little more flexibility with when you can do the work. How did you shape your days? Uh, so day to day, uh, how many, for, first of all, how many days did you shoot? And then secondly, on, to, on the days that you shot, um, what were some of the key tenets that you used to shape the days around? We scheduled for three days and then ended up shooting three and a half days just because there was a bit of a company move on one of the days that was scaring me. And so we had, um, allocated doing another half day, which incidentally turned out to be like our day zero or our first day actually shooting. Um, and that was the the scene of her sort of wrapping the blanket around him, which was like arguably the pinnacle of the piece. Like it was such an emotionally heavy piece. And I kind of was like scared at that, scared about that at first, but really felt like it would set the tone for the next three days if we were able to grab that. And fortunately, we, we were. Kashif and Sham, I would say that they have a little more insight into the scheduling for the next three days, but I, I, like, I was grateful for them to be able to accommodate that on the, the Thursday Eve or the night before we were going to shoot. From the very beginning, 
um, Alex had this clear idea of like performance was the most one of the most important things of the shoot. Um, and again, once we kind of locked in these actors who who are non actors, um, we really wanted to make sure as producers that Alex had the the most amount of time um, on set, being able to go through each and every scene with enough time to take as many takes as it takes to make sure he's able to get what he wants. And I think that was that was our kind of key driver to scheduling the days. Um, really making sure we have enough time at the house. There's a lot of emotional scenes, um, putting in breaks for the actors. Um, I think that it all started from, from that. Uh, we were shooting across Abbotsford, Vancouver, and Richmond. So trying to do something in one day or even two days, it was, that's the company move Alex was talking about is like, well, we need to get from the house in Abbotsford to this like waterfront in Richmond. And really one of the things uh, that I learned, especially in terms of Farhad cinematography, which is gorgeous, is so much of that is around planning in sync with the sun. Honestly, it's like, especially these giant locations, we can't control a lot of the light. So you re the backyard or sometimes even in the house because we're utilizing a lot of natural light a lot of it's working with literally nature and going okay well we need to time this to when the sun's going to be in the right place um and so yeah so that comes into budget as well right maybe if you could afford like a two hundred thousand dollars you can control your light a little differently um but you're you're kind of <laughs> This is a weird example to use, but if you ever play like those NHL or FIFA games, or whatever growing up, you've got to like change your character and you've got all these different sliders, but you have like a limited number of points. And that is what it is. It's like, we can adjust the sketch. We can, we can have more days, but then we have less of this, or you can have more equipment, but then less of that. So you've, you're kind of always trying to balance those out. Um, and again, you're protecting those priorities like performance and authenticity um, as much as possible. What is the main difference when it comes to producing a music video versus a, a narrative? Um... What are some keys to focus on for emerging filmmakers when they're transitioning from that arena to, to, to this one? I think there are differences between music videos and, and you know narrative pieces, but for the purpose of this particular project, I just eliminated any of those boundaries and treated it just like it was going to be a narrative short film that you know later in the editing we just sort of time to the music. So all of the scenes, everything, some things were sort of improv touch and go, some things even like if it was the you know the doctor talking to the to the daughter at the hospital like i wrote out that dialogue just because i wanted there to be something for them to grasp onto so it didn't feel phony or or too hokey like i needed something that drove the scene for for i think more for the for the performers purposes so they have something that they could you know sink into even if it is for a quite a short scene or something smaller it felt important to retain that. So for me, honestly, the way that I approach making a narrative short film and this particular project, very little difference in production and pre-production. It was all kind of like in post. So at no point did you, um, you know, I, I find music videos to be incredibly timing based, right? The way it's cut to certain lyrics or, or particular shots used when, you know, the music crescendos at a certain point. Um, I, how much of that stuff was pre-planned in your head? Uh, how much of that was done completely in the editing room yeah no okay you got me there because like as soon when i wrote this out i basically like b being an editor and knowing that i was going to edit this piece through the song into like the editing soft into premiere and basically like cut off like this is what happens here this is what happens here but mostly because i knew that we were going to shoot on film and we didn't have the luxury of like having too much i knew that i wanted to plan it as closely as possible it wasn't necessarily like shot for shot but more sort of like scene i knew that i wanted it to start like this and end like this and that this was sort of like the middle crescendo part and then everything else when i look at the final piece versus what we wrote maybe two scenes were sort of like swapped or switched over but everything pretty much adhered to to the plan because again we had not a lot of film to work with and i wanted to make sure that we were able to get it in the can what are the lessons that you've learned now uh, and diff key difference between narrative st standard narrative versus music video again the lines are blurred on this one on this particular project but anything that you can think of again for emerging filmmakers where they have to watch out for you know some 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 do's and don'ts when it comes to pre to production uh when it comes to a music video as opposed to a standard nar narrative project one thing on this music video was we knew that it was a music video so we hadn't had a sound recordist or anything on set and I was like, okay, we don't need one. We'll still go through everything, but the pressures of like having to be too quiet or anything, 
that was not a thing. But for certain scenes, like when they were fighting in the bedroom or when um, they do have that sunset moment and um, a shovel to dad sort of breaks down, I was like, oh my god, I wish we had like a sound recorder because the performance there for me was so gut-wrenching and it's like seared into my memory that like I wish that there was an opportunity to capture that and even if I wasn't going I would have used it for sure but if I if I even if I hadn't used it to have that I think would be um quite special so I think that was an oversight on my part is is not recording sound because I didn't think that I was going to need it but in some cases there could be a nice marriage between music video and diegetic sound in in a narrative piece like this that could be that could be quite beautiful yeah and then also i would say even if you're not paying your producers even if you're not paying your cinematographer budget for a focus puller and in terms of post-production i'm assuming that when you were doing the budgeting you didn't want to get to a situation where you ran out of money right by the time you got to post i think it's important that uh, emerging filmmakers hear that is to really prioritize post-production money in in the budget Correct. Yeah, because you're putting in all this effort and you did everything, 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 everything. And then if you just can't do color, it's like the difference between not having that and having that is huge. But you just put in all that effort for everything. So, yeah, it, it's good to and, and to talk to those folks early instead of just budging and just assuming you'll get a deal. Um, even post-production people, like they'll feel more valued if they're involved earlier. And again, going back to like respecting their time a colorist or a sound designer who you're giving a heads up to, they can then choose what day of the week they're going to do it on versus if you say, well, let's do next week and you have to jump on board and I don't have a budget is really hard for them to do anything with um, because you are competing with their paid projects and everybody's had a time through COVID and everything. So um, yeah, giving them that opportunity to be a real collaborator um, will help a lot in, in just their own life. So what are some ways to successfully market a, uh, not just a regular you know, narrative thing, but a music video in particular? And, um, and then as a follow-up, you know, how do you measure success in regards to a music video? I was approaching it more from, the, from a film standpoint and less acquainted with like, the music video element of it, just because obviously I'm coming at this as a, as a filmmaker and just um, hoping that it does numbers on Vimeo and then just getting again, like those different platforms that will direct it to Vimeo as sort of stamps, stamps of approval, or just an opportunity to engage with wider audiences. And then in terms of applying to festivals, I was like a bit disillusioned by just music videos at festivals in general, but because South by Southwest is one of the largest platforms for music videos um, that have actually already been online as well, I was like, okay, this might be a long shot just because I feel like what they program is a little more vibey and cool and like in like we're being um, screened alongside like Lil Nas X. So I'm like just the idea of like having a piece like ours on a platform like that is like I think a testament to like the love and energy that went into creating this piece and it feeling like it could play beside Lil Nas X. I don't know. Let's just let's quickly just go through the nitty gritty of, of that for a second. Um, how does this become a Vimeo staff pick? Like, what do you? So, take me through the steps of you just upload it to Vimeo, and then you get uh, some 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 PR on the video itself through different publications. Like, how, how does how does you releasing pressing the release button to getting Vimeo staff pick happen? Basically, once you upload to Vimeo, it's like eligible to be staff picked, technically. Like, you know, thousands of videos are uploaded on a daily basis, and I think it's understood that like people are sifting through them and trying to find merit and trying to find opportunities to staff pick something and then engage with more audiences. How does uh, an emerging filmmaker without any relationship to these publications approach them to get their music video featured? So you can apply to any sort of these platforms as an emerging filmmaker. So if you approach Boom and you're like, hey, I have this music video that I did, please watch it. It works as, it operates as a film festival. So you, maybe you submit like $10 or $15 as a screening fee um, to have a juror or someone go through the video, assess it. If it's something that feels like the right fit for the platform, you'll be met with a, congratulations, we want you for this. We'll release it on this day if that's okay with you. It becomes a collaborative relationship with that platform. And then, yeah, they just, they, they premiere your work. Um, that brings us to the end of our session. Um, I want to thank Alex, 
Kashif and Sham for their for their time um, and their incredible insight. I think emerging filmmakers that are going to be applying to this grant are going to be learning a ton from this for this particular session. So so I really really thank you for your thorough, detailed, and informative answers. Um, if uh, Alex, do you want to just uh, quickly do a quick plug of, of of where people can find meet meet you at the light video? Yeah, so if you just Google Meet You at the Light, that's Ray Dawson, you can find it on both Vimeo and YouTube. And then if you head to mvpproject.ca slash meet you at the light, that'll take you to our page on the MVP website where you can watch it. You can see the cast and crew involved and you can see some of the other projects that have been funded through the program. Perfect. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you all so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Praneet, for moderating this. No, thank Great you, job. guys. Thank you. I'll meet you at the light.